once a century, once a year. All right, I'll go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming out tonight. My name is Chad Stoller. I'm the local history librarian. Uh, before we get started with anything else tonight, I wanted to talk about a program that we have coming up in November on Saturday, November 11th is for honoring our veterans and we are having a um, coffee and chat event beginning uh, at 10 a.m. on the 11th. So if you're a veteran or a family member of a veteran, please come out. We'll have coffee and some light snacks and refreshments and it'll also be a chance for you to talk about your experiences um, in the uh, service. So we, that's our way of showing some uh, appreciation for our veterans. Um, and then also, if you'd like to, you can email a photo of yourself when you were in the uh, Armed Forces to marketing at westlakelibrary.org. I'll have the sign up here on the, on the piano, so afterwards, if you want to come take a look at this, feel free to. And so, without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Steve Pettyjohn. He will make the official introduction. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the World of War Forum. Uh, first of all, and I think we're going to try and make this a tradition, but uh, next time we'll have books. But uh, we've had some donations from the Cleveland Civil War Roundtable of history magazines that don't have anything to do with uh, the Civil War, the World War I and World War II. They're free. They come up and take a look after the presentation. And uh, first come, first served if you want one. Uh, second. I would not be able to go home tonight if I did not make this announcement. And that is, on October 18th, in this room, for the next, what, four or five days through Sunday, this room will be full of nonfiction books as part of the Friends of Porter Public Library annual book sale. So be sure and head it. If you come Wednesday night and you're a member of Friends, or if you have $10 and you want to become a member of Friends, you get in before everybody else does. The regular sale starts Thursday, continues through Friday. If you feel gutsy, Saturday is half price. And if you really want to get wild and crazy, Sunday afternoon is what used to be called the bag sale. And you would buy a grocery bag for $2 and fill it up. No old bags for sale? No bags for sale this year. You can bring your own bag. And at the yeah, end of the day, like make a donation based on however grateful you feel. You should feel a lot grateful. <laughs> <laughs> um, Steve, yeah. you said nonfiction. You didn't mean just nonfiction. This room will be full of nonfiction. But with the sale. Though. Thank you. Because yeah. there will be another room down there full of children's. What is now the book nook will be all nonfiction. And there will be special price stuff for you big spenders, uh, for what real bargains on real exclusive books, and I don't know what else, OK? But uh, come out and check it out, because uh, uh, you will get lots of bargains. Uh, and if you're a husband and you can take these books home, and your wife can complain about the fact that you have too many books, OK? All right. Um, I have a question. I'm sorry. Yeah. What if you want to recycle some books? How do you What's the best way to give them to you? Guys? Uh, take them to the book uh, to the book nook workroom, which is where the old book nook used to be. If you walk down to the end of the hall, look to your right at the end. There's a slot where you can put books in there. Okay, uh, and I would suggest that you not do it till after the sale, because <laughs> as of next Tuesday morning, we're going to be setting up with about 15,000 books, Whoa. CDs, DVDs, puzzles, games, you name it. So everybody gets a little crazy, you know, trying to get all that stuff out. So new stuff coming in is not what they're looking for until maybe November 1st, and then feel free to drop stuff off, OK? Well, tonight, I am really pleased to introduce a friend of mine, uh, Chris Howard, uh, right here. Uh, from he should get a double warm welcome because he came all the way from Gates Mills and found his way to Westlake Porter Public Library. And uh, Chris is a fellow member of the Cleveland Civil War Roundtable, where we just survived 
a trip to Second Manassas a couple weeks ago as part of our annual fall field trip. Luckily, neither of us got pneumonia, even though it rained on us all day Saturday. But uh, he's kind of a, a great example of what we hope people will do as part of this program. I was talking to him uh, at one of the meetings of the round table, and I told him about this group and how we're looking at uh, World War I and World War II and maybe Korea and the Spanish-American War, and that, you know, it's, it's about people wanting to come in and talk about uh, maybe their family or something they're really interested in. And he said, well, my dad was at the Hurton Forest. I'd like to talk about that. So he's been doing research on the Battle of the Hurton Forest ever since then because I plopped him into a date and said, you've got to be ready. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope you'll, uh, again, uh, join me in welcoming him. And uh, Chris, we're glad you're here. OK. Thank you. Microphone on. Is, uh, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, what uh, they haven't told you is that I was born in Southwest Virginia. We moved to Richmond when I was about six or seven, seven, I guess. And so I still have a bit of a twang sometimes. If you can't hear me or can't understand me, you know, raise your hand and yell the damn rebel at me or something. <coughs> but. Uh, I'm here tonight to talk about the Battle of the Hurricane Forest. Uh, one of the early people asked uh, how come he'd never heard of it. I hope to answer that question for you. And one of the other things that you'll note here, I dated it October to February. Uh, there is a book I have, which I'm going to pass around. It actually says it started in September, so and it went September to January. So it sort of had an indeterminate start and an indeterminate ending. It wasn't very indeterminate on the ending. They cleared the forest by the, the end of January, the beginning of February. Uh, I've uh, dog-eared a couple pages so you can look at a map. I'll pass that around. I'd like the books back if I could. And same thing on this one. I dog-eared not only the map, but also pictures. This one has pictures that I dog-eared. Maybe the pictures are in there. The pictures are in there. But that has a nice map on it also. So, um, besides the one individual who asked me why I'd never heard of it, who was that, by the way? The gentleman there in that nice turquoise shirt uh, said he'd never heard of it, and he wondered why. Uh, do any of you uh, have other questions that you would expect me to answer tonight? Or you just like me to go right ahead and tell you what I know? and I'll let you ask questions at the end. Anything, right. anything else? Yes, sir. Was there any comparable action in the Hurricane Forest during the First World War? No. No. Everybody heard the question? Yeah. Was there comparable action in the Hurricane during the First War? No. Yes, sir. You may touch on this. Well, where was this in relation to the Battle of Bulge? You'll see that about four slides in with a map. And as I pass the books around, you'll see the maps also. The um, short answer is it was about 20 miles north of the northern part of the bulge in the Ardennes. And you could think of the Hurricane Forest as an extension of the Ardennes. Except the Germans chose not to attack out of the Hurricane. They attacked out of the Ardennes about 20 miles south. And I think all of you have probably heard of Malmody, where the Germans Malmody. Massacred, killed, and um, that's on one of my maps. That's actually southwest of the hurricane by 20 miles. So that gives you a flavor of where it is. But let, me, let me go ahead and start the presentation. There's some things we're going to cover. Uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about is the timeline. Where does this fit within the overall scheme of things? And I think part of that will explain for you why nobody's ever heard about it. Uh, the second thing we'll talk about is the map, the geography, what was in the forest, what was around the forest, uh, why did we fight there, those kinds of things. Uh, the opposing forces, uh, I've read different things, but I believe parts of 12 or 15 different German divisions were there. Most of them were severely under strength. And on the American side, they're also 
were about 12 to 15 divisions, except most of them, when they went into the forest, went in it at full strength or near full strength. So the Americans had 120, 150,000 troops engaged. The Germans probably had in total, over the course of the, the battle, 50 or 60,000. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the German tactics and weapons, uh, and the American tactics and weapons. And then I have a brief timeline in the Hurtgen. If, if you read some of the books, like the, the one, the hard co cover one I sent around, uh, they, it's kind of unbelievable. They talk about the, uh, you know, this company A does this, and they get bogged down, so company B comes to the rescue, and they advance 200 yards and dig in. And then the next paragraph, you know, company C does something, and so on. So I'm not going to go through what company A did on a particular morning in November or December. I don't think you need to know that or hear that uh, from me tonight. Uh, but I will try to give you kind of a broad brush of exactly what happened and when. Uh, I think the biggest question is why the battle was fought, why were we there, and what was the aftermath? of that. And as part of that, I'll talk about uh, why nobody's ever heard, heard of it, or why very few people have heard of it. Okay. Everybody knows about D-Day, right? 125, 150,000 men landed in one day from various divisions, the 1st Division, the 4th Division, the 29th Division, the Airborne, the Rangers, and so on. And after that, for a period of about six weeks, they uh, consolidated their beachhead. Uh, they swung toward Cherbourg to get a port so they could bring in supplies. And eventually, uh, they started, and I'm sure most of you have heard, of the uh, Red Ball Express. And Cherbourg was the primary port for supplies until I believe the, uh, either the middle of October or the middle of November when they finally got Antwerp in Holland open. And I made a point here, again, you've probably heard of the Red Ball Express. I did a Google, you know, how far is it from Cherbourg <laughs> to Aachen, which is on the border between Germany and Luxembourg and Belgium, and it's about 20 miles from the Hurricane Forest. And Google told me that that was 440 miles one way. So you can see there was a huge problem uh, as the summer proceeded on with getting supplies. Again, that's probably why you've heard about, the, everybody's heard of the Red Ball Express, right? Does everybody know what that is? Uh, that was the truck convoys mostly driven by African Americans that started in Cherbourg and drove like crazy under blackout conditions as far as they could, as far as the Americans had gone at some point in time, unloaded their supplies, and then went back to Cherbourg to pick up more supplies. So it was quite, quite the operation. I forget the number of trucks involved, but it was thousands of trucks, thousands of drivers, millions of gallons of gasoline consumed just to get the trucks there and back. Okay, uh, you probably, maybe you've heard of this, uh, the breakout from St. Lo, the Falaise Pocket, where the German army was essentially surrounded. I think they had about a 10 or 15 mile gap that they could escape through, and perhaps 40% of the German, 20% of the German army was able to escape through that gap, hightail it back to Germany, and the rest of the Germans were either killed or taken prisoner. Several hundred thousand. Uh, Paris. Uh, Paris was liberated. I've read uh, three or four different recounts of who the first American troops were in Paris. Um, I'm not sure, quite sure who, who in fact <laughs> got the glory since everybody seemed to claim that they were the first ones to march down the uh, Champs-Élysées, or whatever they think it's called. And, uh, 
Champs-Élysées, is that it? And then Arc de Triomphe. They're pictures of the Americans marching. But I believe there were several other American uh, divisions, battalions, whatever, that marched and then essentially bypassed the city because they were chasing the Germans back to Germany. Uh, the first Americans to reach the, has everybody heard of the Siegfried Line or the West Wall? Okay, that was a counterpart to the Maginot Line. The French built a 400 mile wall to protect themselves from the Germans. They neglected to put it up in Belgium and Holland. So when Hitler attacked, they bypassed the Maginot Line, got into France. France fell in 45 days. But uh, the Germans built a similar uh, line of fortifications several miles east of where the Maginot Line was. And the first Americans to encounter the Siegfried Line or the West Wall did so just past the uh, Belgian border uh, near the Hurricane Forest uh, sometime around the middle of September. Again, there are probably three or four different American units that claim to be the first to encounter the West Wall. And some that even say they sent a patrol out that when they got to the West Wall, they found it essentially undefended and no Germans there. But because of the logistics problem with uh, the Red Ball Express, they were told to hunker down. So they didn't do anything. They may have patrolled, but they didn't actually attack along the West Wall. The next thing I'm sure you've heard about is A Bridge Too Far. Had everybody seen the movie? Sean Connery, I think Sean Connery was in that one. And uh, of course this was Montgomery's big operation. He said, give me all the supplies. Don't give any of the supplies to uh, Patton or to uh, Hodges in the First Army. And uh, I'll go capture these bridges so we can get across the Rhine River. And that was the end of September. So now we're at the end of September, and essentially nothing, <coughs> nothing has happened. I show here uh, Antwerp becomes opera. I think Antwerp may have been captured October 24th, but it really didn't become fully operational. The Germans, of course, had destroyed you know, the cranes and the docks and so on that the Americans had to rebuild before they could use it. That was in Montgomery's sector. Your old Montgomery. Okay, so a gap exists, like my friend in the turquoise short, I'm sure. Uh, nothing is going on, right? Nothing happened. It was almost four months from August 25th to December 16th. August 25th was the liberation of Paris. American troops marched through, flags were waving, the French were cheering, and then what happened on December 16th? The Battle of Bulge. Everybody knows, right? Except that there was in fact something going on from roughly the middle of October all the way to the middle of February. And that's what we're talking about tonight, is the Battle of the Hurricane Forest. Uh, I say here the heaviest fighting took place from about uh, the end of October to December 16th. I believe the first American division was committed on October 17th. The second American division was committed on November 3rd. The third on November 16th or 17th. And by December 2nd or 3rd, everybody was going, oh, I won't use a bad word because not much had been accomplished at that point in time. Uh, something happened on December 16th, Battle of the Bulge, and that got a lot of publicity back here. It was the great American victory of World War II in Europe after Normandy. And the Battle of the Bulge, uh, the records I looked up said that went from December 16th to January 28th. I believe January 28th is when the last of the Germans got back to the Ardennes or behind the Ardennes. Uh, put on here Remagen. Remagen was about six weeks later. Uh, most of you have probably heard of that because that's the first bridge that we got to cross the Rhine. Things really started 
Hitler died, killed himself. The Russians were in Berlin, I think a few days before that. And then VE Day, May 8th. So you can see there was a very compressed timeline after the bulge, the Magen, Hitler killing himself, and the surrender. Uh, almost as much time, actually less time, than the time that was spent in the Hurricane Forest. Any questions or comments about that? Any, anybody have any, anything to add to that? OK. So where are we with the Hurricane Forest? We're about three miles in to the German territory east of the Belgian-German border. It's a very small area. Uh, this was a forest preserve, similar to what I was laughing about with Chad earlier. You know, the Wayne National Forest in southeastern Ohio is a forest preserve. Well, the Herkenwald, the Herken Forest, was a German forest preserve. It had been cut, but it also had old, some old growth trees in there. So the newer trees were primarily conifers, pine trees, if you will. Some of the old growth trees were 100 to 125 feet tall. Uh, it's near Aachen. That's why I did the directional thing. And um, it's actually about 40 miles west, I have to get my direction straight, west of Cologne, which is on the Rhine River. And uh, Modell, Walter Modell, who commanded all the German forces at that time had his headquarters in Cologne. Uh, I put up here, I, I had to Google these. I didn't know off the top of my head how many square miles Cuyahoga County was. Since I live the east side, I did Ginaga also. And you can see 50 square miles. I don't know, what did I say? I said if you drew a line from the lake to Columbia Station south of here, over to Strongsville, and it back up to the lake on Lakewood, you'd probably have about the same square miles of what the Hurricane Forest was. So it was a very narrow, it wasn't like you could put 10 divisions in line and all attack at the same time, it wouldn't fit. Uh, the Germans had built the west wall through the forest and it followed the ridge line. Uh, there were several ridges there. You can see, I believe, one of them, several of them. I'm not sure if it's 2,000 feet, but at least 1,500, 1,800 feet above sea level. And I think I have a picture later on that shows you what the ridge line looked like. Uh, the Ardennes Forest, where the Germans massed for the bulge, is 30 to 40 miles south of the Hurricane Forest. And you can think of the Hurricane Forest as the northern extension of the Ardennes. But there were no roads, ridges, and therefore the Germans chose, maybe rightly so, not to mass their troops in the Hurricane. They did it in the Ardennes further south. Any questions about that? OK, this is a map, not sure. And that looks pretty good up on the big screen. Uh, I've marked a couple, uh, a couple of things here. Let me use my mouse. Uh, can you see the mouse there? Does that show up? I guess not. Well, let me point. This is Malibu. And the Ardennes is really right in this area, pretty much where I have the box that says the Hurricane Forest. And the yellow would be the outline would be the Hurricane Forest. These are the double lines of the West Wall. Here they had, I believe there are several <coughs> ridge lines there, and they put defenses on both, both the ridge lines. Uh, let's see, the Aachen is up here. The first here is talking about the first US Army, Courtney Hodges. He didn't get any publicity because there was a guy next to him to the south named Pat in the third army. <laughs> and he got all the publicity. Uh, Hodges, I guess, is pretty, pretty buttoned down. So there's Aachen. And way over here, you can see Cologne up at the top. Can everybody see that? Yeah. So the area of the Hurricane Forest 
is roughly triangular shaped. <coughs> it's on this ridge line. And Aachen is here, and there's a gap between Aachen and the Hurricane Forest. I've read that it's called the Aachen Gap. Very easy to remember. And the reason for that is that in that Aachen Gap, there's low lying land. And the supposed reason for attacking in the Hurricane Forest was to prevent German troops massed in the Hurricane Forest from attacking Americans from the flank as they went through the Aachen Gap. And they were going to go through the Aachen Gap instead of fighting in Aachen itself, because in Aachen they expected it would be house to house fighting. And for those of you that have read anything or heard anything, uh, the worst kind of fighting, the scariest for any troops, or where you're in an urban environment, and every city block is covered by a machine gun. And they're, in this case, Germans in every basement or in every rooftop. And you have to go block by block, house by house. So the Americans said, we're not going to go into Aachen itself, even though that might be the logical thing to do. So they didn't do it. Um, I've often thought of that when I've read about, uh, where was it, in Iraq, Fallujah? I believe they had to go house to house in Fallujah, and there's some interesting stories about the Marines. I think it was the Marines, right? Who's the Marines? Was it the Marines house to house in Fallujah? No? Well, Fallujah, The yes. SEALs? Yes. Was not the Marines here? No. But anyway, so the gap was where the Americans and eventually Aachen was taken. Aachen was taken sometime, in, uh, I believe, in early December. But in the meantime, starting in mid-October, the Americans were attacking. You see where Aachen is. They were attacking from the northwest to the southeast through this corridor right here. So that was where the initial fighting took place. And of course, with the Germans by this time, they had brought in multiple units, and they had occupied those pillboxes, they brought in 200 artillery pieces. They had some remnants of some panzer divisions that they had withdrawn from the Russian front. And they were prepared. Uh, the story goes that when the Americans attacked in early November, Modell, the German commander, was wargaming with his staff in Cologne. If the Americans attack in, in the Hurricane, what do we do? <laughs> Of course, if they got word, the Americans are attacking, so their war gaming went right to warp speed to now what do we do and how do we defend. Very interesting. Uh, that's a picture of the west wall of the Siegfried line, not through a forest, but you can see the dragons. I think those uh, things are called the dragon's teeth. They're meant as anti-tank barricades. And uh, when it's defended by uh, machine guns with crossfire and artillery back behind the line, zeroed in on logical places like roads, uh, it's a pretty deadly combination. Uh, that's a view today, a recent view, looking over the Call Valley. When I pointed before at the direction of attack, that was the Call Valley. And you're looking at where the Americans are coming from towards where the Germans are waiting for them in this picture. So you can see the ridge lines here uh, very well, which is why I wanted to show the, show the picture. OK, uh, probably the, the signature quote here is the bottom one. Um, Actually, that's on the next chart. But the weather was wet and cold with snow. Think of the bulge a month earlier. Uh, there was limited use of trucks. I think I have a picture of a truck sliding around in the mud. Uh, there's one mention of American tanks and tank destroyers going up the one forest path road 
and sliding off that forest path down into a ravine. So American armor, American trucks um, were almost useless here. And of course, with the bad weather, it meant that uh, support from airplanes was also very difficult to find. Uh, men were in their foxholes and dugouts for days. When it rained, the foxholes and the dugouts filled with water. They were being bombarded by the Germans, so they stayed in their hole. And after five or six or seven days, men came down with what's called trench foot. Just like in World War I, for those of you that followed World War I. Uh, the, I put up here one of the divisions uh, did not get a hot meal. Was, yes, sir? What is trench foot? Uh, I knew somebody was going to ask me that. Uh, when your feet are wet for days and it's wet and cold for days at a time, the skin on your feet eventually gets loose. And if it's in boots and now you have to march or run someplace, the skin will fall off your feet and you're incapacitated. Because if, you, if you're an infantryman, you can't, I don't know, Bob, is that the, you're in the Army, am yep. I giving the right explanation of it? Yep. So one of the things the officers are supposed to do is go around to their men and say, take off your shoes, let me look at your feet, put on a dry pair of socks. Here's a new issue of boots. But in the forest, they didn't do that. They couldn't do that. They got in, Germans were lobbing shells at them, and they sat. And eventually their feet, the non-battlefield casualties were as greater, greater than the actual killed and wounded. And trench foot was one of those. And again, if you've read about World War I, that's one of the things they talk about in World War I is trench foot. <coughs> Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, no hot meal. Uh, I think uh, in one of the books they say that one of the regiments got a turkey sandwich for Thanksgiving dinner. Mm -hmm. Thanksgiving occurred. But otherwise they didn't have any hot food for 17 days. Oh, I know what I did on this chart. I looked up on Google. What's the weather like in one of the towns near the Hurricane? Duran, if you look at that triangle, Duran was over here on the right side to the east of the forest. It's one of the kind of limiting parts of the forest. So I looked it up, and you can do this on the weather. You know, if you look at Cleveland weather in November, and they'll tell you what to expect. Well, here, <coughs> what they said about Duran. 70% chance overcast and mostly cloudy for the month. Uh, the high will be about 40 degrees and the low about 28 degrees. Uh, 40 hours of sunshine for the whole month. I calculate that as about an hour a day, right? An hour and a half a day. Uh, precipitation every third day. And um, I put here that it was probably colder, wetter, more cloudy, and certainly gloomier in the forest in 1944 than what it is today and doing. And then I picked this quote out. Um, I can't remember where I got this quote from, but I've, I've read that before. Uh, some weather people think that that's because of the uh, massive bombing that went on and the dust <coughs> that it threw up in the air that caused the weather in Western Europe to be so severe in that winter of 1944-45. And so you've all seen, and probably most of you have seen and heard pictures of the bulge. But uh, they mentioned here <coughs> in one 24-hour period, they had 10 inches of snow, and temperatures were below zero for days at a time. So even worse than what I picked up on during. Excuse me? It sounds like Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, there's a picture of a two and a half ton truck. I believe that's a two and a half ton truck. Going through the mud. like a half track. Is it a half track? You're right, it's a half track, sorry. 
Yeah, I, I should I should know that because the um, I don't think the truck usually had the gun, the machine gun, on top of it the way the half track does. Uh, this is an interesting picture. <coughs> One of the things I read, it's a Civil War guy, they said that this was the worst fighting conditions for Americans since the Battle of the Wilderness. If you know anything about the Civil War, you know in the wilderness there were only two or three ways through the forest, and we chose to attack there because he thought that that would inhibit Grant, it did inhibit Grant from bringing greater numbers to bear on his troops. But what it meant was, they could not maneuver. Uh, Longstreet was actually shot by his own men <coughs> in the wilderness and had to be relieved of command. But that's a picture of the forest, and you can see the uh, trees there, how closely spaced they are. Uh, the caption, which I don't know if you can read, there at the bottom it says that shortly after that picture was taken, a German machine gun opened up and every single man in that patrol was either killed or wounded, including the photographer. So for posterity, we got the picture. But the men, unfortunately, you can see there. How would you see 50 or 100 yards in front of you, especially if the Germans were dug in and waiting for you? <coughs> That's the same picture. Again, you can see the size of the trees, how close they are together. And that was the general uh, way that the Americans attacked in the forest. Small units, groping their way forward. And when contact was made, they had to hunker down and try to figure out how to go get that uh, two Germans behind the machine gun uh, holding up the uh, 50 or 150 Americans. Okay, so who was, who was fighting who? As I mentioned earlier, Walter Modell was in his command post back in Cologne. Uh, he was called the master of defense for some of the things he did on the Russian front. And eventually, I wrote here 13 German divisions, but no more than 80,000 total, and most often less than 10,000 manning those pillboxes, manning those machine gun nests. Uh, one of the things I found interesting, they uh, conscripted the Aachen police force. I think it was about 450 men. They said, you're no longer a police. You're a mini battalion of troops. Go to the Herkin Forest and fight. So I guess it would be the Cleveland has, what, about 1,000 police officers? I guess it would be like they took all the Cleveland police officers and said, you're now a fighting unit. You know, whether you're 22 or 42, you're now in the Vermont. Uh, the American forces, um, I underlined, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, five different units here. Uh, the reason I did that is that the 1st, the 4th, the 29th, the 82nd Airborne, and the 2nd Rangers uh, were all at, on D-Day. They all had basically come in, you know, on June 6th or shortly thereafter. At this point in time, when they came into the forest, they were effectively at full strength or nearly full strength. That's an American Infantry Division in World War II. Uh, 10 to 12,000 men. That would include their three regiments of about 3,000 men each and associated forces, um, engineers, artillery, medical supply uh, with them. Uh, there were about 1,000 men per battalion, three battalions in a reg I'm sorry, three regiments with three battalions each, 1,000 men per battalion. And then each battalion had roughly five companies of 180 men, plus some support uh, elements as well. Uh, the heavy weapons uh, was typically some of those half tracks, uh, maybe a towed howitzer, towed anti-tank gun, uh, machine guns, mortar, 
Uh, and I think every fifth, every fifth company, roughly, was a heavy weapons company. And they often had heavy weapons platoons with the uh, infantrymen also in support. And then four platoons of 42 to 43 men each. So in a battalion, you would have 20, 25 officers. And in the, the regiment, you would have maybe 85 or 100 officers or more, actually. I want to make note here of the replacement system. Um, the Americans chose early on that what they would do when a unit um, had casualties, they would feed replacements in a little bit at a time. And those replacements came from what were called replacement depots. And the nickname was Repel Depel, which the Army has a nickname for everything. And um, most of the replacements, say all of them at this point in the war, were totally green. They might have been drafted in mid-1944. They went through basic training. They knew how to pull a trigger on a gun, but they'd never been in combat. And when they went in as replacements, they were often killed within a day or two because they didn't know what to do. Not a, not a happy situation. Uh, the book by George Wilson, the one that this fellow has over here, uh, he was a 90-day wonder in the 4th Division. And a 90-day wonder was a, an enlisted man who tested as being reasonably smart, maybe had a couple of years of college. And they sent him through a 90-day course to become an officer. And then in his case, he came out of a replacement depot and he came to the 4th Division, I believe, in about uh, the middle of July, after some of the heavy fighting in Normandy, and uh, saying, well, you know, where there are a lot of casualties. I'll digress here. My father was in the 4th Division, and he came out of a replacement depot in mid-July. And uh, one of his enlisted men, I have a picture of him later, I'll show you. One of his enlisted men said that my father was the fifth of eight lieutenants that he had in his unit. So lieutenants, you know, nobody cares about them, right? They're replaced, uh, disposable. I uh, also note here that in the late fall, if you read about the bulge, one of the critical issues for uh, Eisenhower was what to do with replacements, because so many men were lost in the initial phases of the bulge. And so they were scraping cooks, orderlies. Uh, I believe also there was the first time black troops were used with white troops during World War II, because they were running out of bodies. Oh, well, let me, let me back up on that. That's a neat quote here. Um, the commander of the 22nd Regiment was a man named uh, Buck Lamb. And uh, he wrote a book, the guy whose book wrote that book, George Wilson, said that when he came out as a replacement, Buck Lamb told him, if you survive, I'll promote you. He said this to, I don't know, half a dozen lieutenants who were coming in as replacements. So of course, it scared the hell out of this guy. <laughs> to, you know, 22, 23 year old, you know, 90 day wonder to have their regimental commander tell them that. But it was a big problem in the forest. Okay, this is in a sense what the battle was all about. I touched on this earlier. The Americans would go on night patrol and feel the German position. Americans would attack on a narrow front with two or three companies, a couple in the front, a couple on the side, and they would move out 
uh, after the Americans put in an artillery barrage because if we, we had artillery and several times the uh, Air Force came in, both the uh, uh, P, whatever they were, you know, for the low level bombing as well as the B-17s. And then the Americans unit would encounter a minefield. And I don't know that I went over, did I go over bouncing Betty's on the other chart though? Mm -hmm. I skipped through it. I did. I wanted to talk about that. A bouncing Betty was a nickname for a German mine, anti-personnel mine. And if you stepped on it, I think it was 15 pounds of pressure, so not much pressure. In the chest. Yeah, it would uh, bounce up about a meter and a half in the air, and then when it got up here, a meter and a half, it would explode. So uh, two things could happen, with, well, three things, I guess. It could be a dud, which of course didn't help your nervous system if it was a dud. Uh, but otherwise, it would explode and, I'll say, uh, cause a very grievous wound to your bowels, very painful, might not kill you right away, but a very, very uh, horrible wound. Uh, the other thing that uh, might happen is that it might explode one meter up, not a meter and a half. And when it exploded one meter up, uh, it would explode where men's genitalia are. And so at least in that era, most men did not want to have their male equipment cut off. And so when they encountered a minefield and one or two or three people had already stepped on mines, the Americans stopped. They were scared to death, right? If you go this way, that way, three steps, you step on a mine, you lose your balls. So they would stop, they'd call for the engineers. The engineers would come forward and they would spend a half a day trying to clear the minefield. And for the next day or two, while they had stopped, uh, they would be under constant artillery fire because the Germans had zeroed in with their 88s, their artillery, relatively short range artillery. And they also had zeroed in with their uh, rockets, their barrage rockets, the so called screaming memes that had six rocket launchers come over and explode in about a 50 square, 50 to 100 square yard area and hurt anything that was standing up. So the Americans didn't accomplish very much. They may have got a few hundred yards of terrain. They got a lot of casualties. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, to, to take casualties back had to be done with a two-man carrier. So two men could carry one man and carry him back a mile to a mile and a half through those woods I showed you. Uh, all usually under constant artillery fire. So it was not a good situation to be in. Oh, here's, uh, here's where they are. Okay. So we talked about the bouncing Bettys. Uh, I don't know the exact number. <coughs> My guess is it was probably 50 or 60,000, maybe even 100,000 of those were in the forest. Uh, they were used to channel the Americans. So, you know, maybe there was a path through the minefield, but of course the German artillery had that zeroed in. So if the Americans uh, could see where the minefield was, because some of them, some of the minefields were marked by the Germans, because they didn't want to step on a mine when they went on a counterattack. Uh, I called it here a terror weapon because of what I said earlier. It essentially immobilized the troops until they could get an engineer, engineers up to clear it out. Uh, the German 88 is an interesting weapon. Um, they were also used for anti-aircraft gun, anti-aircraft, that's a flak gun that you see when the Germans are firing up at the B-17s. That was an 88. Uh, they also used it as an anti-tank weapon. They could load it with armor-piercing uh, shells. And then they used it for what I'll call close-in artillery. So it's something that might go two or three miles <coughs> with an anti-personnel. Uh, one of the things that often happened... Chris, you have a question on that? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Didn't they also put 88s on the Tiger tanks? 
Yes, yes. It was a very formidable weapon for the Germans. Very uh, able to be used in a variety of ways. Yes. How did the American engineers clear the minefields? Uh, well, th there was metal, so they had a metal detector. And uh, they could, you may have seen this in some of the movies, they could go forward on their bellies with a bayonet, searching for it, and if they got it on the side as opposed to 15 pounds of pressure, they could dig around it and pull it out. That, that was a pretty laborious process, especially if the Germans were shelling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Are many of these pods uh, still in place today? Oh, boy. I don't know. I think what happened after World War II, you know, we had captured several million German soldiers. And I think what we did for several years was have them go and do a mine clearing. You know, we gave them equipment, but we had them do mine clearing operations where we knew mines had been laid. But I'm sure there's still some that, you know, were not caught. <coughs> yes? Uh, I was in Germany uh, from uh, 72 to 76, and we were still finding a few of these occasionally. Yeah, I'm sure that's the case. I mean, they still find Civil War rounds that are uh, hot, that are active. That's what, 160? There's stuff still left over from World War One, right? Yeah, there's every once in a while you hear about that in Belgium. Or, um, okay, uh, a tree burst. Let me talk about a tree burst for a minute. You saw those trees; they're 100 feet up, got branches out. A tree burst is when the artillery shell came in. Normally, what's supposed to happen with that? It lands on the ground big explosion and it throws shrapnel in a I don't know, 50, 50, 75 feet around where it landed, maybe longer. So what the Americans were trained to do, logical thing to do in that case, is to get flat on your belly and get in the foxhole or some kind of hole that you've done. And that's great, except that in a tree burst, they would hit the top of the tree and explode and then all the shrapnel would come down on you. If you're lying flat on the ground, up there, shrapnel comes and gets you. Uh, unlike in a normal situation, it lands 25 yards to the right or 20 yards to the left, and you're flat on the ground and in a hole, you're probably, you're gonna be okay. But in a tree burst, you wouldn't be. So a very, very uh, scary thing. The new newbies that I talked about, what would often happen with them in the first artillery barrage, they would either go flat or they would start to run away. And in either case, it was deadly for them. The optimum position to take was to hug a tree. So you saw those big trees, go hug it. If it lands up there and spreads a trap all over the place, you're okay. And you have your helmet on, of course. You can also turn the tree limbs in the trap. Yes. Yeah. yeah the, uh, if you've ever seen pictures uh, after an ice storm on a mountain bridge, like in the Appalachians, the, uh, uh, all the tree limbs, because of the ice, have been shredded, if you will, and only been standing is the main guy. And in Hurricane Forest, that's usually what you saw after the Americans went through and the Germans had done all their barrages. <clears throat> All the limbs were broken off. So this gentleman said they could hurt you, fall 100 feet, or bigger than my arm. It's not good for you. And the only thing standing would have been the, uh, the helmet of the tree trunk. And then here I mentioned the screaming ninis. Uh, I think we're using those, or we've given some of what we have today uh, to, uh, is it Heimers? Is that the rocket we have today that we've uh, given to Ukraine? to go after the Russians, similar, similar weapon. The Germans had this, <coughs> I don't believe the Americans had an equivalent weapon system in World War II. We do now, we go involved here. Uh, the Germans also had some Panzers available for counterattack. Um, they had their entrenchments and their pillboxes with machine guns and crossfire. So they had everything they needed. 
have a nice defensive situation. Okay, I'm going to give you a very abbreviated timeline of the battle. Uh, the 9th Division attacked 3,000 yards, so half a mile, with 4,500 casualties out of their 10,000. The 28th Division, when it relieved the 9th, and uh, their commander was a man named uh, Norman Dutch Coda. See somebody nodding in the back, you probably know him because he's considered one of the heroes of D-Day. If you saw the movie from 50 years ago, was it Robert Mitchum played him? Yeah. yeah. I think it was Robert Mitchum played him. In, but he went in on the second wave with the 29th Division on D-Day. And uh, some people think he should have gotten, uh, he got two distinguished service classes that day. Some people think he should have gotten the medal of honor. So he was all over the beach trying to get men. Uh, the 29th, as you know, um, Follow that, you know, the Bedford Boys, you know, where they went in basically the first wave, and everybody in the first wave for the 29th Division was killed or wounded. He went into the second wave and was able to get them off the beach. But because of that, he got promoted. <laughs> now he's the division commander of the, not the 29th, but the 28th. And he was given an attack plan by, he went up to see the Army commander and the Corps commander. And they gave him an attack plan. And uh, they said on this such and such a day, I think it was two days later, for the first day and night you're going to get into position. The following day you're going to attack. And we're not going to do any artillery barrage. You're going to get these guys by surprise. And uh, no patrolling. You don't have time to patrol. Just attack. So that's what they did. And they attacked along the one trail that went down into that valley and then up the other side. I think I have a picture of that here, and maybe my book has a picture of the call, call trail also. But <clears throat> they got through to the other side of the Call River, just a little stream. And on the other side of the stream, the Germans counterattacked with <coughs> like five or six Panzers. They cut off the two or three companies that had made it through the river. And uh, thereafter, uh, all of Dutch Coda's uh, activities were to try to reinforce and relieve that cutoff group of men, which he never did. I believe four or five hundred of them were taken prisoner by the Germans. So it was a disaster. Um, I'll yeah, say here he had, uh, had 6,000 casualties. So 10 or 11,000 men and half of them casualties in two weeks. Uh, 15th through the 2nd, the 4th Division went in. Uh, the 22nd Regiment. Had several thousand casualties. Uh, a note here in the first the first two and a half, three days, all three battalion commands, commanders, all lieutenant colonels, almost unheard of, were killed or wounded. So they had three battalion commanders. All three of them had to be evacuated daily or evacuated wounded in the first couple of days. Uh, and that's because the Germans by then were ready. <coughs> they knew what was coming and they were ready. Um, they had about 150 to 200 replacements come forward every night. And at the end of that time, they basically were destroyed as an effective fighting force. Nobody knew anybody. Uh, they had maybe in a, a, a platoon, they might have six or eight people that had been there before. They hadn't gotten enough replacements, so maybe they had 28 men, uh, probably a replacement officer. So it wasn't good. They were um, relieved and sent to a quiet sector on the Western Front, on the East, whatever, on the German border. Uh, that 
quiet sector turned out to be the northern shoulder of the Battle of the Bulge. <laughs> so on December 16th, the Germans came rolling by, they lost a lot of men, not that many men. They kind of swung back and let the Germans go through, and so they were on the flank. Uh, First Infantry Division, the Big Red One, uh, they came on, the Rangers came to help them. Uh, they took uh, Hill 400, and there are two companies of 400 men. They had 100 plus killed and wounded. The, bullet, the Ranger Company, by the way, was the one, the Band of Brothers. And then the bulge happened. Nothing really happened in the forest during the bulge. Everybody was scrambling, you know, get reinforcements to Bastogne, help out Patton and put the Germans back. Then in January and February they continued. And eventually some dams on the Ruhr, R-U-R River, were captured intact. And that was done by James Gavin and his 82nd Airborne and the 8th Infantry. Glad you brought that up. The RUHR is a river to the north, and it's a different river from the RUR. And the Ruhr River is where the major industrial area is. Right, that is, that's their industrial center is where it was. Then it is now. It's where most of the manufacturing is located. Right, RUHR, but that's RUHR. This is the RUR, oh. and the source of it is in the ridge line above the Herkman Forest. And it flows down and goes into the Rhine, I believe, near Cologne. And there were dams for hydroelectric purposes up there. And somebody had asked, well, nobody had really asked, but the, one of the reasons that was given after the fact for why the Americans fought at Herkman was to get to the dams before the Germans released all the water and flooded the Aachen Gap. That's the R I had the same confusion. It's the R U R River. And there were two dams on two branches supplying hydroelectricity, hydropower, and uh, I guess prevent well dams were there for the hydropower. But we were concerned after the fact, people use that as justification for fighting with the Germans never released the water. Go figure. Okay, I decided to, to show this. Uh, okay, on time, I think. This is, does anybody know what this is? Bloody bucket. Yeah. Pennsylvania National Guard. Yeah, the Pennsylvania National Guard unit became the 28th Division. And as all of you know, since you're from Ohio, Pennsylvania is the Keystone State. So their shoulder patch is the Keystone, Red right Keystone. And uh, I don't know if the Germans did it or the Americans did. I think both of them did. After the battle, they called this the bloody bucket because of the casualties that they took in the Hurricane Forest. I think the Germans did. They had a name for it, which I can't remember and I probably couldn't pronounce anyway. But basically, it was the bloody bucket. And as Bob Pence mentioned, it was originally you know, a number of the units in World War II were, in fact, National Guard divisions that were activated. That's why the 29th Division, you know, on D-Day had the, whatever it was, 40 or 50 guys from the same small town in Virginia that all went on, in on the first wave because they had trained back home in Bedford. Oh yeah, I wanted to uh, mention Dutch Coda here. Uh, he received a lot of the blame for the disaster. <coughs> I think undeservedly so. You know, when he's given an attack plan by people 20 miles behind him and told this is your launch date, and it's less than 24 hours later. Right? You salute and you do what the guy tells you. But uh, he was given a lot of blame. He did remain in command of the 28th Division, but after the war, 
He hoped to remain, he was a West Point. He hoped to remain in the Army and be promoted as Major General. And uh, he was never promoted. He was, in fact, asked to resign in 1947, they claimed, because his health was poor. They gave him a physical and said, oh, you have to, you have to get out. So, uh, but like all the others, he was hampered by the forest, the terrain, the weather, and frankly, the German, Germans as well. Okay, so what's the aftermath? Uh, it's difficult to pin down exactly the total American casualties. Uh, these are the, I'll call them the official ones. And then there are 9,000 non-battlefield related casualties. Trench foot, pneumonia, uh, battle fatigue would be uh, guys that couldn't take it anymore. You know, they're Two guys left from their platoon, and they freak out, and they are in their console shivering, and they're no use to anybody, so they send them back to the rear lines. Uh, a couple of, I mentioned this earlier, uh, worse conditions for, yes sir? Is the 9,000 non-battle related casualties included in the original 24,000? No. Okay. No. It was okay. 30, 32 to 35,000 total casualties among the 100, 120 that fought there. <clears throat> and I mentioned those three early ones. I think I said the 9th, 28th, and the 4th. Between them had about half those casualties. The other divisions that were engaged had a lot of casualties also, but not as severely as those three. And I wanted to mention the replacement. I think I mentioned that earlier. The American replacement system is probably not as well thought as it should have been. Uh, in the Civil War, um, there are a couple of Civil War people here, they can correct me, but in the Civil War, the uh, American units basically were fought out until there was nobody left. And then they were given an opportunity to re-enlist and they brought in a whole new unit and they renamed it the, 84th Pennsylvania instead of the 17th. Uh, the Confederates used a different strategy. Uh, where they could, they sent the men home in the winter, and they recruited from amongst their compadres in uh, you know, whatever county they had come from and brought replacements back with them. But of course, as the war dragged on for the Confederates, there was nobody left to bring forward. But the uh, I'm not sure what the best method for replacements is, and I'm not sure that the Americans had ever planned on casualties to the extent that I shared with you. Oh, I wanted to mention this. 